from WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odess Gillette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Perspective is a radio program that examines contemporary issues using the principles of the Baha'i Faith. If you want information on the Baha'i Faith specifically, you can go to the website www.baha'i.org. That's B A H A I dot O R G. Or you can call the toll free number 1 800 22 Unite. Today I'm playing a fifth in a series of interviews with Mr. Ray Estes a Baha'i from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who comes from a background of a born-again Christian. He studied the Bible for many years and has developed new understandings of some of the Bible stories now that he is a Baha'i. Ray starts out this segment by sharing his understanding of how to interpret the Bible in regards to the prophecy of the second coming of Christ. One of the biggest concerns that uh, we have today is Everybody would like to see uh, the world change into something much different than what it is today. But the religious community is basically hoping for what is known as the return of Christ. And uh, I know less than anyone else as a young man and as a Christian what had my expectations of what I thought should happen. And the traditional story was that Christ would return from out of the sky and basically he would call up his believers and we would meet him in the air and then we would come down and he would establish his throne on the earth and judge everybody and raise the dead etc various versions of it but that's the basic idea Mm. now we know that uh, this idea is not new to Christians. This is actually what was expected by the House of Israel, who were also waiting for the coming of the Messiah and are still waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the interesting thing is that they uh, have such similar uh, belief systems, then their expectations were not met. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like to give an example of that by just reading some of the things. Uh, I have a list of some of the scriptures that describe what were the Jews expecting and what did they get. Okay. And uh, when we realize uh, that uh, this is a time-honored way of doing things. So mm-hmm. let's just, uh, let me go through a couple things. Um, one of the things that uh, he was to be born in Bethlehem, and of course most people uh, agreed that he was. Mm-hmm. And then he was, it says uh, in, in um, uh, Isaiah that for with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment upon all men and many will be those slain by the Lord. Now, uh, Jesus did anything but do that, mm-hmm. but he was expected to come and basically uh, destroy the enemies of Israel, to destroy the enemies of God. Uh, he was in effect they were hoping him to come and execute judgment on the Roman Empire because of their obviously in their mind wicked ways Mm -hmm. Uh, and so when Jesus didn't do that that was very very disappointing another one um, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign now here it is says there will be a sign that you'll know that this is true Mm. the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel now you know it's pretty clear that uh, he has a name that he's going to be called this mm-hmm. Messiah that's to come and they're not talking about some they're talking about when he comes and uh, you can imagine their disappointment when they were told that his name was Jesus mm. and so this did not go over well as a matter of fact his name wasn't even Jesus when it gets down to it it was Joshua Jesus is the Greek name for Joshua mm. and so the only name by which we can save be saved according to the traditional way of thinking that a Christian can be saved and is, is by the name Joshua. Well, mm-hmm. most people didn't know that. They've been using the name Jesus all this time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for people who want to be literous, literalists, they uh, kind of get themselves in a jam with some of these things. But here's, 
Here's another one. Um, he was to uphold the law. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I give you. This is in Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Mm -hmm. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. That's Exodus 31. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's saying that... Uh, one of the signs of mm -hmm. the Messiah will be that, first of all, they will add no scriptures to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Not add anything. Only the things given by Moses. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, they're going to observe the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath is on Saturday. Mm -hmm. The Jews have been keeping it this way for 3,000 years, so they mm -hmm. really got to fix on what day is the Sabbath. Right. Well, you notice not many Christians do much on on Saturday. There's a few, uh, Seventh Day Adventists, etc. They do, but but the average Christian doesn't keep the Sabbath. How does that happen? Well, they decided to switch to Sunday. They Why? They called it the Lord's Day, and they because you see, when when Christ came, lots of things changed. For one thing, they didn't just add scriptures; they added a whole lot of scriptures, the whole New Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so if you take the Old Testament and believe that it's true, yeah. and then you go against it, uh, this is pretty hard for the uh, Jewish people to accept that these changes uh, are to be made. But what is the explanation then for the spiritual or symbolic well, interpretation? We'll, we'll go into okay. that. See, I want to get right. down kind of straight here. All right. What? Why? You know, we've been we've been giving the Jews a bad time for a long time, mm -hmm. and what we Baha'is try to do is Let's have some understanding here. Mm -hmm. Let's have a little compassion. Mm -hmm. Because things were quite confusing. It's no wonder that only few. Mm -hmm. And of course it doesn't surprise us Baha'is because we believe in effect something similar has happened. And it's hard for Christians to make the shift, but we have to have a little compassion for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the ways is by just seeing how tough it was for the Jews. Mm -hmm. He was to uphold the law is one of the key things. They thought he should keep the law. And you know that when Jesus came, he said he was going to keep everything in the law. Every, not one little smidgen was going to be changed. Then he wiped it all away when he said, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself, that that fulfilled the law. Mm. Well, that's pretty hard to take that just like that. But this is the thing. Spiritually, he was saying that when you become born of the Spirit, which is what Christ was advocating, when you become born of the spirit mm -hmm. when you're in the spirit you not only do the law you'll even go beyond the law you'll do more righteousness than those who keep the law mm -hmm. because you'll do it from the heart and not just outwardly uh, to please others or to uh, uh, do it to look good in front of the nations or even to feel good to yourself well I, I do the right thing this is way beyond that and so mm -hmm. that's just but I, I deviate okay the idea, you know, often Christians talk about when he comes again, every eye will see him. Well, this was also true in the first coming. Okay. It says, every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. This is in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. The Lord will bear his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of one of our God. That's Isaiah 52. Now, later on, the disciples mention this, uh, this idea as having come true with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And of course, they didn't see any mountains being flattened. They didn't see any valleys being raised up. But you see, it was being taken literally, and therefore they couldn't see Jesus because they interpreted these passages literally. But in fact, Jesus did all of it. And I'll go back and explain that later. Okay. But the main... Oh, there's a couple of these here. From, uh, um, the sun shall be darkened, and the sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of a great and dread dreadful day of the Lord. Now, uh, that's one. And for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened, and the stars no longer shine. Well, I mean, the Israelis looked up into the sky, and 
and <laughs> the sun was shining brightly. And the moon seemed to be okay too. And if one of those stars had fallen, it had crushed the earth. Hmm. But Jesus fulfilled all of this. And in fact, it's mentioned in the New Testament how that he did fulfill this. Hmm. But because it had to be understood not literally like a, a, they missed the point. Mm -hmm. And the number one one that really explains this, uh, I'm going to start with this in the, in the uh, getting back to uh, how does this uh, really happen. Uh, they expected Elijah to come first. Now mm -hmm. this was very clear. The last verse of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is that Elijah will come first. And um, I'll, I'll read that to you. I will send you a prophet Elijah. I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, this is Malachi. The idea being that, uh, that Elijah, and everybody knew all about Elijah. Oh, Elijah was very famous. You see, he was one man that never bothered to have to die he was so virtuous that God took him to heaven in a fiery chariot now a good a good Israeli boy would know or a girl would know that well how's he going to come back well of course he would go the way he he would come back the way he went mm. he would come in a fiery chariot and of course where would he land well of course downtown Jerusalem you know right in front of the temple he would get off and when you see a fiery chariot coming out of the sky with Elijah on board, you'd know this is it. Nothing happened of anything of that kind. Oh, how disappointed they were. And yet, you have to go back and to understand it. Now I'm going to get how these things work. Mm -hmm. Jesus uses this example of Elijah to tell us how we're supposed to think and I suggest to you how we're supposed to think for the second coming as well. Mm -hmm. And it goes this way. Elijah was a prophet of God who lived at the time of a wicked king named Ahab. Ahab had married an unbelieving woman named Jezebel. Now apparently she must have been a pretty good looker because she sure had his attention. And, but she was wicked and she was bringing all manner of evil doing things into the society. So Elijah went out and said that the king who was a Jew, should get rid of Jezebel as she was a wicked queen and bad for the country. Well, she didn't quite like that. She didn't want this to go on, so she wanted the death of, of, of Elijah. So Elijah fled into the wilderness where he was living off the, the land. It says the birds of the air even brought him food to keep him alive. And uh, we know what he looked like because there's a description of him in, in the Old Testament. And he, his hair grew out. And he dressed in animal skins. And he carried a big staff and he had a big belt around it or girdle around his waist. He was really looking rough after living out there for these many years. And so uh, this is the man then that God is so pleased with that he takes him to heaven in a fiery chariot. So this is a well-known story in among the history and the people of Israel. So what happened? Well, it seems that a cousin of Jesus of Nazareth, whose name was John, began to go out and teach. But one of the other things he did was rail at the king, whose name was Herod, who had married his, uh, uh, I think it was his brother's wife, or his his. Uh, had married his brother's wife which was illegal to do before the brother died and on top of that she was a wicked woman and she was doing everything wrong and so John says to basically to Herod get rid of her she's the you know not the right thing for Israel well she doesn't like to hear this so she sends out her agents to try to kill John John goes into the wilderness where it says he ate locusts and honey to stay alive and his hair grew out and uh, he started dressing in animal skins. And he carried a staff. He had a big girdle around his waist. And he'd come out of the woods and he'd teach the people and baptize them. And then when the agents of the queen would come, he'd flee back into the wilderness to hide. But one day the teachers, the rabbis and the Pharisees came and said, 
uh, who are you anyway? And they mentioned several people's names. And then somebody piped up and said, are you Elijah? And this is interesting because you don't hear people talking about this much. Mm-hmm. He said, no, I am not Elijah. I No, I am one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Well, you see, the prophecy says that in a sense, Elijah would come back and prepare the way of the Lord. Mm. But he says, no, I'm not Elijah, but I'm preparing the way of the Lord. Well, some of the disciples were there and they heard this. And later on, when John sent them to follow Jesus, they followed Jesus. And then one day they were sitting around and one of them said, uh, Lord, we know who you are, speaking to Jesus. But where is Elijah? Now, this is a big mystery, you see. And now we find out how God does things. Now we can find out from Jesus himself how God does the return. Jesus said, essentially, the people have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. But you, the disciples, those that are following Jesus, you have eyes to see, and you have ears to hear. And so it's given to you to know these things. He said, John was he. Know this. John was he. And then he went on later to say, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Mm. Not the same person. Not the, not the miracle thing. Mm. Fiery chariots and all that. No, 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 no. That's not the issue. He came in a similar pattern so that the whole, all the people could see that a prophet like Elijah, even to so far as living in the wilderness and preaching against the king of his day and and dressing in animal skins and living off the land. All of that they could see. But the key piece was that the spirit that was in him and this power with which he spoke was like the way of Elijah. Hmm. So now we know something. When God is speaking of the return, he's not returning the same individual outwardly. These are but vessels. But the spirit and power of God shows up Mm. And that's what we're to recognize. That when we see the Spirit, the loving and beautiful Spirit, and the power to change hearts, that's when we should know we're we're seeing the Spirit of Christ returned. Mm. And in that case, they had to see it for the first time. And of course, it didn't go well, as we all know. Mm. And now... I'd like to now explain some of how spiritual fulfillment takes place. And it's, again, the New Testament that can tell us how this takes place. Now, the idea, uh, I'm going to give you two two uh, little pa- passages that kind of give you an idea of spiritual in, in, uh, how spirituality works or spiritual interpretation. Now, most people know that a sword is a metal, two-edged, in those days, a two-edged blade, uh, with a handle on it. That's what a sword was. But here we get a different understanding, a spiritual understanding of the sword. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. How the sword with which the coming Messiah was to slay and, 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 and do things on people was really the word of God, how it challenges people, how it cuts through uh, the layers of, of uh, shall we say, uh, crap. Clergy, <laughs> clergy crap that, that often throughout the ages builds up mm. and confuses everybody and leads us in such a journey of ridiculous beliefs that take us into magic and and all manner of things that that never happen and it mm. and it it keeps people from seeing the truth when it does mm. and here's another one: the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned that's first corinthians second chapter fourteen first okay so here we have. Another explanation that uh, spiritual things are foolishness to those who want the foolish physical signs. Everybody wants to see it with their physical eyes. But you see, those that are born of the Spirit see with spiritual eyes and can see through this 
and see how the spiritual fulfillment of the so-called literal happenings are the true way God operates. He operated that way in the first coming of Christ, and I promise you, he even more so works that way in the second coming. Mm. Now, it was very clear to the house of Israel that that uh, the Messiah was set on the throne of David. I mean, no doubt about it to them. He was to take over the rulership. Herod was on his way out. Mm. And uh, Jesus was, or the Messiah would take his place. And of course, nothing of the sort happened. Mm -hmm. But here's how this is to be understood. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. This is in Matthew, the second chapter, the sixth verse. In other words, the Gospel of Matthew confirms the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah was not only be a ruler, but that Jesus was this person. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, he didn't take the throne. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was to be understood in a different way. And here's the fulfillment of it. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And it's still a spiritual kingdom. And when he returns, he will establish a spiritual kingdom in that we will have that spiritual love of God and the spiritual conditions of born-again experience for the entire planet Earth will take place. Mm. In a sense, when the second coming comes, he's going to baptize the entire planet Earth and bathe it in the Spirit of God, but it will come over a process of about a thousand years mm. called the millennium. But let's go on with this idea. Okay. He was to slay many with a sword. Now here's the quote. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he goes on then to, of course, explain that the, the uh, enemies would be those of a person's own household. Husband or fa father against son. Mother against daughter. Because why? Well, because one would begin to see with spiritual eyes and the other would see with physical eyes and miss the point and There'd cause be division between yeah. them. So the word of God does cause separation in the beginning because people don't understand and some do and some don't. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this idea. Two men working in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. Now the foolish have thought this to mean one will fly up in the sky and the other one's going to sit and stay there. But it really means this. Two people on a job both hear about the message of the coming of the Lord. One sees it, understands it, and his soul is lifted up. He's, he's, he's in heaven. His Lord is returned. He changes his life. He reconditions his whole way of thinking. The other guy just keeps on living the way he's always lived, knows nothing, sees nothing. Two men on a roof, one will be taken and one will be left. It mm. means the same idea. Two men mm. seemingly doing the same thing. They hear the message, but one gets it and one doesn't. And right now, today on earth, God is calling the first fruits. He's calling those to recognize what's happening. The world is changing. Wondrous signs all around us. But only those who have the heart to see the beauty of the truth who will recognize the Spirit of Christ in this day are going to be moved by it, mm. challenged by it, and become believers. I'm one of those people. Mm. I was raptured on June 7th, 1966, mm. when I had looked, saw, and heard the message from God that one called the glory of the Lord was had taught a whole new way to see things, a whole new way to understand that would bring peace between Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, and Buddhists, that would unite us with our former enemies and bring peace to our hearts and show us a way to get past all the discrepancies of religion that we've created over the years and bring us together into a brotherhood that would cover the planet Earth. Mm. It's so beautiful to me. And I, uh, on that day, I saw who this was. This was the return of the Spirit of Christ. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, my whole way of seeing life went from a very material way to a very spiritual way. 
Yes, I had the Spirit of Christ in my heart. But now I'm seeing how the Spirit and power of God is going to bring this to the whole earth. Mm. But moving on. Okay. His name was to be Emmanuel. Uh, obviously, we know that uh, uh, even though his name was Jesus, the word Emmanuel has no power, neither does the word Jesus. It is the spiritual truth clothed in these words that provides salvation. Emmanuel means God with us. And uh, and G- Jesus, though, although the name was not literally Emmanuel, was the embodiment of God with us. Mm-hmm. And, of course, literally the name was actually Joshua in the beginning. Okay, he will come. Um, he was to uphold the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. This is Jesus talking. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by many means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. That's Jesus quoting Mm -hmm. that he's not going to destroy the law. Now, some people think he fulfilled it. He did. He fulfilled it by giving us a new understanding of what is meant by that. What is hateful to you, do not to your fellow men. This is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. <laughs> it's a quick way to get to it. This is in the uh, even uh, in the Talmud they understood this. Um, uh, many Jews had already come to this understanding mm. that when you have it in your heart, and when you operate from love of God. You go even beyond the little nitty-gritty things. But on the other hand, it's not fulfilling God's purpose necessarily to continue the same rituals. And as we know, the uh, Jesus established a new organization called the church, no longer called the House of Israel. They had new ordinances. They even brought new scriptures, which went against what the Jews expected because in Deuteronomy it said you can't do that. Mm-hmm. But here was the key. They brought a spirit that united people who had always hated each other. Romans, Greeks, and Jews all hated each other. If a Jew touched one, one hand, a Jew had to go home and wash his hands, wash, his, wash himself up, because it was so such a terrible thing to even touch a Roman. Mm. But Jesus brought such a new understanding of the word and, and the law that they wound up sitting together in a pew. There was Christian. in the, There was, I'm sorry, there was Jew Roman, Roman, Jew, and Greek one in Christ Mm. oh that we could understand that spirit changed the Roman Empire Mm. and the world of that time became Christian in 400 years Mm. it didn't happen overnight everybody wants everything to happen overnight you see we want instantaneous gratification but it's a process because it requires humans to decide for themselves to make a choice that they will choose the way of God over the way of men mm. and it's no different today the challenge is from in front of us again mm. um, oh the sun shall be dark we got to tackle that one okay you see Baha'u'llah the glory of God in English uh, is is that light of the spirit of Christ coming to the world again and um, others will go into all the details of that but the basic idea he appeared in the Middle East he was beaten, he was tortured, he was taken in chains, he was taken to Israel. There he was sentenced to life imprisonment. But from there his light went out throughout all the world. And now there are Baha'is all over the planet in small groups of people coming together of all the various backgrounds and religions becoming one. And we Baha'i basically means the people of the light, uh, the people of the glory. But it's a glorious light. A light that brings peace to us and unites us. Now, this um, this was not is not an easy thing for some of us when we first hear it. Mm-hmm. We're we're kind of thrown by it. But you see, when we when we look up and realize that the sun has been darkened, the moon has been darkened, and the d- stars have disappeared. Now, what does this mean? It means that, as he said it, the sun symbolizes the coming of the spiritual power of God, such as Jesus such as Moses. That's, that's that spiritual sun that radiates on our hearts. This is in the world of the spirit. 
He's, it's, the Messiah is like a sun shining. And in every case, there's one believer who becomes the kind of center upon which he builds and, and goes forward. And in the case of Jesus, it was Peter. Peter was the, as he said, upon um, thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. And uh, so he's the kind of the moon figure. And then all the believers throughout these years who stood up for Christ, who mm -hmm. stood up for the truth under tremendous pressure, they are the stars in the heavens. Mm -hmm. But after years go by, with interpretation of the word of the manifesta uh, manifestation of God, when, when we start interpreting, we start slowly blinding the sun's rays. We interpret so we don't have to follow his teachings anymore. We find ways to get around it. We make it so that we follow what other followers taught and not what he taught. And that's when we say, well, if I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, he took my place, therefore my sins are forgiven, and now I'm basically I'm scot-free and let's go do it again. And we'll go through this again. You see, that this is one of the tricky ways we've gotten around it. Jesus made it very clear. He says, He who hears these sayings of mine and doeth them is like a man who built his house on rock. Hmm. And when the wind comes and blows, it stands. But for those who hear these teachings of mine and don't do them, they built their house on sand. And when the wind comes, it will collapse. I suggest to you, we're seeing collapsing houses of life. People who think they can get away and not do God's will and use interpretations it's true that when we sincerely go to God and ask for forgiveness that we will be forgiven that's always been there but the idea is we must do it with all of our hearts and then go and don't continue the behavior it's true though we occasionally slip and we go back to God with a repentant heart and again we are forgiven but when we don't change our lifestyles, when we don't change our values, and we continue on the road of error, and then turn to God and say, Jesus took my place, I suggest to you we've created a problem. Mm -hmm. And that this has been taken too far, and we have a culture that is just reeked in corruption, and the sun has been darkened by us and our teachers who are now blinding us from the reality of the truth of Christ. And the moon, in this case, this is the clergy. These are those who have been entrusted by God to reflect the life of what Christ taught. And what do we get? So often we get preachers who are doing the very things that we know are wrong, and they too get up and say, oh, I made a mistake, but... Uh, you know, I, blood of Jesus takes it away, and so back on track again. But the continuous thing is going on, and now we know of of priests who have been carrying on all kinds of misbehavior, and and all manner of people who are supposed to be the lights. When after the sun has left us, the moon is to shine in our lives, and unfortunately they use this position to so often deviate us from the way of God. Not all, obviously. But let's face it, the truth is not seemingly always... We have 300 or more different Christian denominations. Something's wrong. We're not getting a clear picture anymore. And lastly, where are the heroes? Where are the heroes that will keep them some pure? But let's face it, adultery, corruption is all around us. Who is saying the truth to us? We're not hearing it. But I'm suggesting to you, we are in that condition when the light of God, the new sun must come and shed again the bright light of the truth with hope and power and a new moon where we have leaders that are truly exemplifying the life and the stars, ourselves, those who wish to stand up and let their life be shining like a bright star in the heaven of understanding and virtue. That's the actual fulfillment of some of these uh, issues. Mm. So, basically, to sum this up, uh, I'm taking for granted that most people have heard of Baha'u'llah and, 
and know some of his teachings. But his fundamental teachings are, and I'm going to share this because this is the bright light of the truth today. There's only one God. We've called him many different names. We come from many different cultures. But there's only one Lord. And we know him by his truth. That, that Lord is the Lord of justice. That's the Lord of virtue. That is the Lord of obedience. That's the, the Lord that teaches us to love each other with all our hearts, to make sacrifices to stand up for the truth, for us to be bright lights in a dark world. This is what we're to be, but this is also that Lord who teaches us those teachings. And the second, there have been many teachers sent to the planet Earth. God left nobody out. These teachers, be they Buddha, Krishna, Jesus, they came with a message calling us to virtue, calling us to nobility, calling us to understand. And they all were part of God's plan. And in this day, it's time for us to come together and appreciate each other, not take some stand that there's one group superior over another. And let us now come together and let the spirit and power of God guide us to our new destiny, which is to build the kingdom of heaven on earth. Not by magic, but with the sacrifice of those things we know are not good for us and letting the spirit and power of God guide our lives. And lastly, the new principle that we didn't know before. There's only one race, the human race. We are one people on one planet. The earth is a single country and all mankind are its citizens. We must respect that. And when it says we're to take care of the poor, not just the poor downtown in the city we live in, but it's the poor that are on the earth. We need to create a new way of doing things to where those who have more can find ways to help those who have less have what they need to have a good life in the material world as well as the spiritual world. So what I'm driving at is the truth is here. The bright light has come. The glory of the Lord is shining. And yes, the mountains, in fact, have been flattened. And even the seas are dried up. In the day we get in an airplane, this modern world, it doesn't matter whether it's a high mountain, a low valley, or the ocean. The airplane makes it all the same. And so the barriers that have kept human beings apart, created different cultures and races, is over with. It's all one now because com communication and travel have brought us together. Hmm. A young man in the year 1844 stood up and said, he called himself the gate of God, called us to understand that we've entered a new world, a new age, age of maturity, the human race. We now have to open our eyes and see the truth. God has poured out knowledge upon the earth like it covers, the, like the, as it says in the Bible, like the seas cover the ocean. In other words, the water's everywhere. The word of God of knowledge and the word of God of, of information is obviously everywhere. Mm. We have the tools to build a better world now. The, there's not a lack of food. It's a lack of distribution. Not a lack of medicine. A lack of will. Not a lack of means. But we have not made the great leap of understanding that we're to be responsible for the whole human race. Not just America, all peoples. But it's a challenging idea. And yes, it will have its time. Many people will want to stick with the old ways until it becomes obvious in time the beauty of this message and of this truth. And see with spiritual eyes and, spiritual, and hear with spiritual ears the truth. Mm -hmm. Now here's what happened to me. I was investigating this. And I came to a passage that, uh, that Baha'u'llah said that I really had an effect on me. It says in there, O oh people, by the power of God's might, resolve to gain the victory over your own self, that happily the whole earth can be free. He basically was saying that the problems, we always want to see the problems in other people, when in fact the problems are with us, ourselves. The person we wake up and look in the mirror, there's the problem and there's the solution. When I make the choice 
to turn to the light and let God's Spirit into my heart, it changes us, gives us power to overcome this world. To understand that that's where it begins. And the next one, there was another passage that really touched me. He says, O people of God, do not busy yourselves in your own concerns. Let your thoughts be fixed upon that which will rehabilitate the fortune of mankind and sanctify the hearts and souls of men. What did I hear? All my life had been told the issue was for me to be saved. Hmm. For me to get to go to heaven. It's all about me. Me, me, me. <laughs> What's good for me is good for everybody, so to speak. But I would suggest to you that I knew there was something wrong with that. Not that I don't want to go to heaven. Not that I don't want to escape hell. But that's not the reason. The reason is because I love the truth. Because I love God. I love His Spirit. I love all that He reveals and in His Son, Jesus Christ, I love the beauty of His message. And when I see and hear that a, per the, a person with a new name, new outward appearance, but speaking that same Spirit, but in a way relevant to the time in which we live, in a way that takes away all these barriers between science and religion, takes away the barriers between the religions, takes away the barriers of the races and between men and women and, and shows us a new way to build life and create with the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to take Jesus in junction, to love one another to another level of understanding, a new worldwide brotherhood of all humanity and that God will pour out His Spirit and give us the power to transform this world into the kingdom of God on earth. Hmm. It will take a while. We have a thousand years to do it. But every day we must get closer by each one of us stepping closer to that heavenly reality. When Jesus came into the world, the Romans, the Greeks, and all those hated each other. Uh, there was great religious consternation. But when the smoke cleared, so to speak, we had a new institution with new scriptures, with a new name. Uh, it wasn't Emmanuel, it was Jesus, or, or Joshua, whichever way you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And a new community that united the enemies of that day into a common kingdom in the church. It was a spiritual kingdom, but it spread throughout the Roman Empire, and the whole Western world fundamentally changed. Now we are living in a world where all the hatreds are there, as obvious what's going on in the Middle East today. Jews, Christians, and Muslims are at the forefront of the conflict. And there's no understanding. There's not real compassion for each other. If there ever was a time we need to have a message that can remove the stigma we feel towards each other, a way of thinking, and this is where Baha'u'llah teaches us. We have been in a school for 2,000 years. In the early days, we were taught as first graders and second graders. Then we graduated up to, say, fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders. And then we, quote, unquote, went to middle school. All these taught by Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. But now it's time to go to a yet another level. We're still in school, but now the teacher is teaching us in a new way. And each stage that we go, we learn a little more so that we can get ready for the next stage of our development. We've gone through the adolescence period of human history. We have now entered the adult period where we can see for ourselves, know for ourselves, and we're independent enough. We don't need a clergy anymore to tell us. We can see for ourselves and when we, as a, as a people on planet Earth, recognize that one Lord has come, that Israel is going to be land, known as the land of unity. The reason the Jews have come back to Palestine is to found the spiritual capital of the planet Earth. Muhammad was there. He, he blessed Jerusalem. He blessed that land. He did not intend for us 
to do with the things we're doing. If you'll notice, the Dome of the Rock is is there. It's a sacred, holy place, second sacred, most holy place in all of Islam that's there. The Christian churches and all the holy, sacred places where Jesus was are there. And, of course, the Jewish wall is there. But there's a new thing that's happened in northern Israel in fulfillment of Isaiah that says that the house of the Lord will be raised up in the latter days on the mountains of Israel and all nations will flow to it. The law will go out from Jerusalem into all the lands thereof. Well, we believe the new Jerusalem has been established in this case not only in a spiritual way but in a physical symbol. In northern Israel, there's the um, a beautiful mountain called Mount Carmel and the Rose of Sharon because Sharon is a plain above Carmel has appeared we believe that's Baha'u'llah he was brought there in chains he walked that mountain and he described how they were going to build um, terraces basically up the mountain each terrace represents one more stage of human development there's a message in that mountain it's absolutely beautiful. It's a symbol of the beauty of man's progress, stage after stage, towards God. And uh, people from all over the world, from China, from Russia, from Ethiopia, from America, from South America, all the races, from Mongolia, these are all places where there's the Baha'i Faith teaching. The Baha'i Faith is the second most widely spread religion in the world. It's not in numbers, but in localities and in opportunity to hear about it. It's there. In a way, you could say the Baha'is are people who honor the religions of the past, how they have done so much for us to get us to this stage. But we cannot continue to repeat the mistakes of the past. Mm. And therefore, we have to move forward together into the future where we fulfill the hopes that all the religions had, where we'd come to realize that we are one people, there is one God and one spirit, and that spirit is the spirit of unity and love. And until we wake up to that reality, we're continuing to see our sin sons sent home in body bags, mm. regardless of which side you're on on these issues. But we have a ways to go. There are still some very terrible things that will happen because of our refusal to open our hearts. But the good news is there is an end to this nonsense. Soon the nations will realize the futility of violence, the futility of hate, and realize there's only one way to go back to the truth that we always knew, love and justice. Mm. Where there is no justice, there can't be the love. You can't oppress people and expect them to love. Justice must be established on the earth. Love will begin to flow as the people turn towards God. Mm. We cannot continue doing things the way we've been. Uh, we're going to burn the planet up with our foolishness. Uh, but in fact, we are going to stop before it's too late. This is a promise that, that the truth of God will become so bright and glorious that Let's just say we're going to need sunglasses to keep out the light. It's be so bright. So the message of the Baha'i faith is one of hope. One of hope and one of brightness of the future. Yes, we will see all these terrible things happen. But actually, the worst thing that ever happened, we haven't even realized it. The worst thing was World War II and World War I. Over 100 million people added all up together, including the Cold War, have died through violence trying to establish false concepts of truth including communism which was perhaps as much antichrist as you can get these movements brought so much pain and sorrow to us but we have already forgot how terrible it was in many cases people who don't read history right now we're we're feeling the pain what once millions died and and left us yes we were contrite and we established the United Nations after World War One. Of course, we established the League of Nations trying to solve this problem. After World War Two, we founded the United Nations, but we always just come short of giving the international 
uh, movement any strength to actually carry out its purpose. This time, with fewer deaths, but with being on CNN, it's a little more impressive. We are, through technology, seeing the pain and the sorrows of our fellow human beings, and it's starting to move us. Mm. Since when did we ever care whether there was a tsunami on the other end of the planet? We never really worried about that in the past. That was their problem. Now our hearts are being moved. We're beginning to realize these are human beings. These are our fellow humans. And look at the, the way the West really moved forward in a wonderful way. More of this is needed. Uh, obviously, we have some problems with this because we noticed that even in our own backyard in, in uh, New Orleans, we didn't meet up to our own expectations of ourselves. We realize that we have a ways to go. But I suggest to you, we are fast growing up. Mm. We're getting the message. Unfortunately, I'm afraid, there's a few more severe blows that have to take place. Frankly, I believe we're going to see some very difficult times in the near future, but we are going to come out of it. Mm. And this time, we're not just going to set up some uh, soft, easygoing organization. This time, we're going to say, wait a minute, it's time. And we're going to take the model of the United States. And I'm, this is now my way of expressing this. I always respected how Virginia led the way into the freedom of the United of the people of, of the United States. If we go back and remember that after the war, to free ourselves from bring, from Great Britain, we established the Articles of Confederation to be the rule of law. It was a weak agreement, whereby each of the states was an independent country, having its own army, its own uh, system of uh, banking and everything else. But we were only going to unite when there was a common enemy and for certain trade agreements. And, uh, but it didn't take us very long to realize, first of all, the big states started pushing the little states around. Virginia, for one, claimed all the territory from her borders westward to the Pacific Ocean. She was going to get her. And who's to stand up to Virginia? She was one of the strongest states in the Union or the strongest states in the Confederation. And... Uh, and nobody could stand up to her. Let Delaware raise a voice and she could get a good swift kick. It, it, it just was uh, this type of situation that it became truly very early on recognized as creating chaos. And the wise men of this 13 colonies gathered together. But Virginia was at the forefront of it. Men like Jefferson, men like Washington, Madison particularly Madison and Hamilton and all these. They were Federalists. And then, of course, Jefferson wasn't a Federalist. He was for a, keeping it loose, keeping each state independent. He was for states' rights over federal rights. But George Washington and Hamilton and Madison were for a federal government whereby there would be a government above the states. The states would still have a lot of power, but they would set up a federal government that would have checks and balances and Madison proposed the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all that we now hold dear. But you see, if the states had stayed independent, Virginia would have had an advantage. And some of the other states like Massachusetts at the time were too strong. And Pennsylvania, New York, the bigger states, they were going to get theirs. To heck with those little states, okay? Actually, South Carolina at that time was a very strong state. But Virginia was top dog. But Virginia, recognizing that this was not good for her in the long run, her statesman stepped forward and offered the Constitution of the United States, which put, in one case in, in, uh, in the Senate, that the vote of Virginia was no stronger than the state of Delaware. Mm. Now that's giving up power when you... Virginia was much larger and more populous than Delaware, but gave equal voice. But at the same time, in the Congress, it gave the voice to the, those who had greater populations. House of Representatives. House right. of Representatives. And then a court to be independent 
to decide when issues got out of hand. It was beautiful and has been beautiful. Not perfect. We all know it's not perfect. Look at our history. But what a beginning. We quickly went from the Articles of Confederation to a federalized citizen system, and Virginia led the way. Her statesman, Washington, became the first president, and at one point they wanted to offer him to be king, and he so graciously refused and set it up so that we could have an elected president or an elected... People were afraid of this. Jefferson was one of them so afraid of a federalized system. But when he became president, he began to recognize it was a pretty good system. <laughs> he wound up getting behind all of this. And the rest is history. This country formulated by these wonderful people at that time from all the states created a beautiful country, a beautiful nation. But it, and with all the problems everybody else has, but a way to resolve them if we can cut down on the corruption that does come often. At the same time, this union has stood for 200 years with all of our troubles and with all the human error and flaws, we have managed to keep and grow and go forward and progress. Oh, isn't it time for the United States of America to follow this, the example of the state of Virginia and come to the fore? And yes, at some point, give up some of its sovereignty for the sake of the betterment of the entire planet Earth. We can do a similar plan, not the same, but similar, that protects the rights of all individuals, protects the rights of all the nations, and at the same time gives us a federalized system that can protect the environment, can take possession of the resources of this, of this planet and not use them in a way that is running out of gas, so to speak, literally, mm. but can use it wisely so that all of the people of the planet can benefit and we can go and have programs to clean up the environment and make this place a garden of what it's intended to be. Mm. We're not hopeless. We're not helpless. We have the knowledge and understanding. All we lack is the good will mm. to, to, to believe that the human race can do this with God's blessing, with God's inspiration, our perspiration. This is our future. This isn't a vain hope. The prophet of God coming in this age, that voice of the Spirit says to us in this age, it is not a hope. It is an inevitable result of God's blessings on this planet Earth. We are going to have the United States of the planet Earth, not that title, but that idea. We are going to see the day when justice will be the principle by which things are governed. And when, a, and when a governor of a country commits a crime against his people, he'll brought to, be brought to trial and he will be sentenced and punished. He will, we won't have dictators getting away with doing all manner of evil against their own people. Those days are coming to an end and they better start shaking in their boots because it's coming fast. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak to these are my own thoughts. They are based on the teachings that I'm gaining from Baha'u'llah. I share them with passion from my own heart. And um, I'm sure that they're not completely accurate. But at the same time, I hope I'm interested you capture the spirit of the beauty of it, the spirit of the hope of it, and the joy of participating and having a personal destiny that each one of us has to help bring this about. Thank you once again, Warren, okay. for letting me speak on your uh, wonderful program. And I wish you well, and I hope many others can come and share their heart and uh, the spirit of the Baha'i perspective. Thank you, Ray. It's a pleasure to have you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Mr. Ray Estes, a Baha'i from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who comes from a background of a born-again Christian. If you want information on the Baha'i faith specifically, you can go to the website www.baha'i.org, that's B-A-H-A-I dot O-R-G, or you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you'll join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective.
This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station.